Well, it's time for your questions and honest answers. And Pat, this first question comes from Maria, who says, I have read the Bible, but I'm currently reading the New Testament again, and I'm confused about Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Do we really need to tear out one of our eyes or cut off <laughs> one of our hands if it causes us to sin? No, I, I think uh, Jesus is speaking uh, metaphorically, if I can use that term. He doesn't want you to, to uh, mutilate yourself. Some people are actually taking that literally, and I don't think that's the case. What he says is, if, if what you're looking at causes you to sin, then stop looking at it. If what you're doing with your hand, if you're stealing money, stop doing it. And uh, that, that means you, you, you forbid your organs to participate in sin. I don't think it means cutting them off. It's, it sounds pretty extreme, but it, I don't think Jesus meant that. Okay, this is Charlene who says, I'm trying to decide where I should tithe. A lot of websites say the tithe should definitely go to your local church. Is this true or can I send it to others such as CBN, Local Humane Society for Animals, or just give it to a friend in great financial need? I want to do the right thing. Um, I think the most important thing is that you ask the Lord what He wants you to do with your money and uh, then follow His leading. Uh, they're a wonderful organization. The idea that your tithe belongs to the local church, I mean, that's a great thing for the church to say, but uh, it's straight, it, it isn't really biblical because we are all the body of Christ and we give to the, those in need. I, I think, though, that giving to a relative who's in need is not part of it. I, I think you ought to find an organization. I, I just don't think... A dog and cat shelter, for example, is what God had in mind uh, mm -hmm. with that uh, tithe. But um, of course you give to the local church. Of course you give to those others. You, you know, if there's an Old Testament example where, uh, you remember, uh, well, there was Melchizedek and uh, he blessed uh, Abraham and Abraham gave, gave him a tithe. And the Old Testament example that we have in the New Testament is that you give it your tithe to where you are being blessed. And I think that perhaps is, uh, is, is a good example. All right. Okay, this is Jean who says, My husband and I were married for 23 years before I found out he was seeing another woman. Ours was a very lengthy, nasty divorce, and he came out on top financially with full control of the business we owned. My ex's life is great, even though he's cheated, lied, and stolen from me. He now lives with his girlfriend, traveling and building a brand new home. Does God overlook some people's sin with no consequences if they ask for forgiveness? How come I feel like I'm being punished for my sins, but my ex gets a pass? Um, you read in the Bible, and it says, I ask God that very question. They're fat. Their children are prosperous. How come the wicked prosper? That's been a cry all through the ages. And the Bible says, God took me up to the end and showed me their end. And I saw where they're going. They're on a slippery slope into hell. And your ex may have done you in. He may cheat. He may lie. He may steal. But one day, there's going to come a day of judgment. It may not be in this life. It may be in the next. But whenever it is, the penalty is going to be ungodly. So I recommend that what you do is follow the Lord and have a loving heart and a forgiving heart and let God bless you in your way and let Him go. All right? Okay, this is Ann Pat who says, I've heard of the amazing benefits of yoga. However, I've also heard that Christians should not participate in these exercises because the positions formed are of false gods. Is it true that Christians should abstain from yoga, yoga exercises? All right, look, certain stretching exercises are good for you. Just don't call them yoga. I mean, call them stretching. And before you begin your serious workout, you need to warm up a little bit and then stretch. I mean, it's very important <clears throat> to stretch the muscles before you start putting heavy loads on them. Otherwise, you're going to break something. But uh, I think yoga, as it's uh, in its ultimate form, uh, you're, you're saying a, a, well, a, a statement, in a sense, to a false god. Uh, you're worshiping false gods. I mean, there's a lot in yoga that is 
is clearly demonic, and you don't want to be involved in that. Okay, this is Julie, who says, in Matthew 7, 14, the Bible says, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. I think there are a lot of people in the church today who've prayed the sinner's prayer and have been baptized, but aren't really saved. What exactly must we do to be saved? Well, what we must be do to be saved is to be born again, and the born again is a transformation of our life. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And there has to be a new creation of being born again. It's a real experience where you become a new person in Jesus. But it's not for us to say who's going to hell and who isn't. It isn't us to say judgment is in the hand of the Lord. And if I were you, I would stop looking at people in the church and say, well, that one's going to hell and this one didn't. God didn't give you that authority. The authority rests in the Lord himself, who is the ultimate judge. Jesus Christ is the judge. The Father is the judge. But we're not judges. So but what do you need to do? You need to have your life transformed by the power of God. And he said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, uh, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. So are you truly doing his will? Is your will given to him? Do you really love him? And have you been born again? And that's, that's uh, you know, that's a decision that you make, your conscious decision. I'm going to, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Okay.